often, I think we, it's easy to romanticize pioneers for justice and think of all the great work they did and think about like, it's a Sweat versus Painter, Eric Brown versus Board of Education. But these are real people who suffered and Sweat suffered. He suffered, like I said, he had a heart attack. His marriage was um, lost to all of this. And he didn't even get to go to law school and, or finish law school. He didn't become a lawyer like he wanted. What's up, everyone? It's me, Brooke. Thank you so much for joining me for part, is this 12? I, I really lost track, but <laughs> thank you for joining me again for my series, The Untold Stories of the Civil Rights Movement, where I look at what I think are some of the most important civil rights cases. I discuss them, break them down, and let you know why I think they're important and what we can learn from them. So let's get going for this week. So this week, we're looking at the case of Sweat versus Painters from 1950, and it's a desegregation case. Now, I know you're thinking, I thought Brown versus the Board of Education was a desegregation case. Well, you're right, but before there was Brown, there was Sweat versus Painter, and another case that was actually decided the same day as Sweat. Um, but this case was very critical to getting us to Brown. So let's get into the facts. So this case is about a man named Heman Sweat. Yes, human like our beloved toys from the 80s, not Herman. But uh, Mr. Sweat, he was a very smart man, went to Wiley College in Marshall, Texas, did very well, decided to go to medical school, but then that was up in Michigan, it was too cold, went back to Texas and worked as a postal worker. And in that capacity, he fought for the rights of the black postal workers. He was an activist, an anti-Jim Crow activist. Um, and he also helped with voter registration and tried to stop the all white primaries, a subject we'll talk about a little later in this series. Um, and he also helped them with filing lawsuits. And in that capacity, he realized, you know what, I kind of like the law. And so he wanted to get into the law. At this time, the NAACP were trying to get what we were, I referred to before as a test case to the United States Supreme Court to test um, Jim Crow laws. And so he wanted to go to law school. His mentor said, why don't you apply to the University of Texas School of Law? Um, because they shouldn't admit you, you're black and we can use your case. If you're denied because of your race, then we can use that to take that all the way up, potentially to the Supreme Court. Um, and at this point, Texas had no law schools for black people. And the way that their integration or segregation laws worked at is that if there was not a comparable black school, then they had to admit the black students into the white school. So he applies to the UT School of Law and he's well qualified. And they tell him he's well qualified, but they reject him and they tell him it's explicitly because of his race. And that was Theophilus Painter. And that's how you get the defendant in this case. He's like, you're not getting in because you are black. And he held off for a minute and talked to the attorney general of the state. And the attorney general was like, yeah, he can't come in here. He's black. Which for, for Sweat actually was great. So then they filed a lawsuit. He, him, along with the NAACP, they filed this lawsuit saying, hey, um, I'm be my constitutional rights are being violated. The the trial court says, you know what, you're right, but they didn't rule on any relief. Instead, they gave a continuance for six months and allowed the state of Texas to create a law school for black uh, students. And so after six months, they dismissed the case saying, well, there, there's a law school. They agreed to open a law school. They hadn't opened it just yet. They agreed to, so therefore they dismissed the case. Um, they decided to appeal in this time, or Sweat decided to appeal in this time. There was a law school that opened up for black students. And so because they opened up this uh, law school for black students, um, Sweat did not, and he did not apply to that. Instead, again, he sued. The appeals court sent it, the case back down and say, look, you got this new law school, see if it's comparable. Because remember, the law of the land at this time is separate, but equal. So see if it's equal. It's definitely separate, but is it equal? And the trial court, of course, said, yeah, yeah, it's fine, 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 it's good, it's good, it's good, it's equal. Sweat appeals, the appellate court says yes, and text the appellate court in Texas, like, yeah, yeah, it's cool, we, we agree. Texas Supreme Court does not hear it, and the case eventually makes its way all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. By this time, the famous civil rights attorney, Thurgood Marshall, my inspiration for becoming a civil rights attorney, he joined this case and he was actually going to argue it in front of the United States Supreme Court. And Thurgood Marshall here, as well as the NAACP, there was a, a debate going on internally. Do we ask for more equal 
while we are separate or do we try to abolish the separate but equal system altogether? Thurgood Marshall was of the mind that we need to abolish um, Jim Crow altogether because it's just, it's, it's, it's unconstitutional. So that's what they were trying to do with this case. But when it got to the United States Supreme Court, they narrowed the scope, which brings me to the issue. Now the issue in this case dealt specifically with graduate schools at state universities and whether or not the uh, 14th, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment limited the state's ability to distinguish between black and white students when admitting them into graduate schools in the state system. The holding. The United States Supreme Court unanimously held that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment required that this law school, the University of Texas Law School, had to admit the petitioner or Mr. Sweat into their school. The reasoning. Well, again, the court here wanted to narrow its scope. It was not interested in deciding whether or not separate but equal was constitutional. Rather, what it wanted to see is, did the school, was the school that was created by Texas, the law school created by Texas to admit black students, was that actually equal to the University of Texas's law school? And they looked at some key indicators to see whether or not they were equal. One was, the faculty size, the full-time faculty size. I think UT's faculty was 16 full-time faculty members and the new school that ironically was named Thurgood Marshall School of Law later on, much later on. Um, that school only had like four. The law libraries were not comparable. I mean, the UT's law library was huge. This new law library was very small. The court also really focused on the differences in experiences and how the experience of the black students who were really isolated from the future attorneys within Texas, how that was a disservice to them. So collectively, the court looked at all these things, like I said, faculty size, law library, um, experiences, and said, you know what? These two things aren't equal. They're separate, but they're not equal. Now, one other argument that the court considered briefly and quickly dismissed was that, well, you could say that the white students are excluded in the same way the black students are excluded. And the court was like, no one's no one's gonna ever like throw that up there. Like that's not a thing. Like we're not even gonna. No, they're not comparable. No one's saying, well, I'm excluded from the black school, so I'm receiving the same type of treatment. It's, it's not a thing. So the case was reversed, and Mr. Sweat was allowed to register for the UT School of Law. Law. Um, unfortunately, because of all the stress of this case, he suffered some major health setbacks. He ended up having a heart attack. Um, and so when he applied or when he actually started law school, um, his illness prevented him from really thriving and he didn't do well and he eventually had to drop out sadly There was a huge stress on his marriage. He was married to his high school sweetheart, but because of the stress of everything um, they were divorced they got divorced and then he eventually moved to Georgia, I believe, and became a social worker and did that for 20 something years. So why is this case important? Well, it's important for a few reasons. For one, it was the precursor to Brown. So Brown was four years later and it was by the same attorney, Thurgood Marshall and the Legal Defense Fund. They were able to tweak their strategy, use what they learned in sweat to really get what they ultimately wanted, which is just to abolish the separate but equal doctrine and to overturn Plessy. And so it was important. It was also important because when the court looked at things like experiences, that's an intangible uh, effect of segregation. I think personally, I think that was important because later when you have Brown versus the Board of Education, you have the Kenneth Clark Gall study and the court really grabbed on that and say, okay, so there are these intangible effects of segregation that impacts the minds, the psychology of black and brown students, or brown students, um, black and brown students. And so I think that's also something that they were prepped to sort of see with the Sweat versus Painter case. So it's important for that piece and seeing that segregation, the impact of that is far more than just being able to have a law degree from a particular school, but the social and psychological impact that it has. And then finally, I think this case is important because it speaks to something that I haven't really addressed directly. And it deals with what happened to uh, uh, Sweat after this case, which is the, the health impact. And often, I think we, it's easy to romanticize pioneers for justice and think of all the great work they did and think about like, it's the 
Sweat versus Painter, Eric Brown versus Board of Education. But these are real people who suffered and Sweat suffered. He suffered, like I said, he had a heart attack. His marriage was um, lost to all of this. And he didn't even get to go to law school and, or finish law school. He didn't become a lawyer like he wanted. And so I think it's important to step back and really appreciate even more of um, the sacrifice that people uh, made in order to bring about equality and to not just keep it as this romanticized uh, view of fighting for justice. I know sometimes I have the tendency to do that, but he, his story is a reminder that, man, people really did suffer. Sometimes they suffered the threat of death or maybe even death. And sometimes it's like these health, it, it wears on you. Injustice wears on you. Oppression affects you in all types of ways. And, um, I think that's important to keep in our minds and to, again, appreciate the sacrifices of others. If you would like to know more about this case, I have a great book. Um, I haven't actually got a hard copy of it, so I'll just put like a, you'll see it on the screen, but it's called Before Brown, and it deals with this case of Sweat and, versus Painter, and it talks about Thurgood Marshall, Legal Defense Fund, and their strategy, and goes more into the background. So you'll definitely wanna catch that or check that out. If you like this video, please be sure to hit the like button below, whether that's a thumbs up or a heart, I would greatly appreciate it. Please share on all platforms. Um, let's get the word out, educate anyone you think needs to hear this information. Please be sure to follow me. I am on Facebook at Paluki's World Productions. I'm on Instagram, it's Paluki's World. YouTube, I think it's just my name, Brooke Gurley. I'm also on Twitter, Paluki's World. And I have a blog, palukisworld.com. Please go there and subscribe and you'll never miss an article or a posting that I have. And you'll always be on top of everything. Thank you all so much for joining me this week. Come back next week. I'll have more great cases for you. I'm kind of going to pop up all over the place where I'm in the, like the civil rights era. So, you know, I'm mean, in the 40s and the 50s. My go on to the 60s, but I'm in that era. Um, so come back next week for more great cases. Take care. God bless.